Hi, everyone. I'm Christine Kwan, President and Executive Director of Creative Capital. I'm so excited to welcome you all today. Artists, friends, and supporters, you're about to witness and experience dozens of exciting new projects that we are funding in the performing arts, technology, and literature. Many of these projects are at their earliest stages and are years from becoming a reality. So you are really the first to see what's to come. I wanna give a special thanks to the Warhol Foundation, our board, the National Advisory Council, and all of our friends and donors for making our programs and services possible. Thank you so much. to the Creative Capital Carnival Day. I hope you're enjoying being in this movie theater, which looks sort of like if Wes Anderson had an architectural love baby, love child with Wes Anderson. It's me, Christina Wong. I was a Creative Capital grantee and um, it changed my whole life. In fact, I, I, for a few years, just didn't have a personality. I would just tell people I was a Creative Capital grantee and that seemed to communicate enough. And I had to put very little effort into doing work on myself. Did you know that not only you can support this kind of work as a patron, but for as little as 65 cents a day, the price of a cup of coffee in the 80s, you too can ensure that the future of creative capital continues and that artists have access to things like rehearsal space, time to work on their craft, pay for collaborators, and production costs by giving as little as 65 cents a day, you too can help the future of creative capital artists. Did I get that right, Sally? 65 cents, right? Is that, why, it's such a weird number. Why, why don't we ask for like a buck a day for, you know, for inflation? I mean, you can't even get coffee for 65 cents a day, Sally. Hello, I'm Meredith Lucen, author of The Shadow Worker. Please close your eyes. Imagine that while you are immobile and sightless, someone half a world away has access to your mind and uses it to work on your behalf. You are Cora Anino, the New York based CEO of Anino Advertising, and your shadow worker, Dana Liwanag collaborates with your unconscious while she labors at her Manila workstation half a world away. This allows you to work all the time, even when you're asleep, going far beyond what Versus Technologies envisioned when they developed Versalink to allow American executives to take full advantage of outsourced labor from the Philippines. But while other pairs of executives and shadow workers only fuse their minds during work hours, you and your shadow worker have given each other access to all your thoughts all the time, since you don't have reason to keep secrets from each other. This is because your shadow worker is also your half-sister, who used to be your half-brother. You were born and raised in the Philippines together before your father brought you to the U.S. when you were 12. Versalink allows you to maintain your bond with your sister while harnessing each other's mental talents in unprecedented ways, which gives Anino Advertising a huge advantage over its competition. This catches the attention of Connor Versus, the inventor of the very technology you and your sister rely on to stay connected. Connor has recently decided that Earth needs saving and elicits your services to convince billions of people to care about the planet too. You suspect that Connor's motives aren't purely altruistic or as it turns out, purely professional and your ensuing entanglement with the world's richest man risks not only your life, but the future of humanity.
My name is Bria Baker, and I'm an activist using words as a medium for achieving joy, safety, and equity for all Black people. I recently finished up my manuscript for a book called Rooted, The American Legacy of Land Theft and the Modern Movement for Black Land Ownership. Among other things, this book tells the story of my family, who has owned land in North Carolina since just after emancipation. Since then, this land has been a site of love, autonomy, and freedom for us. It's where we host weddings and funeral repasses, where we grow food and hunt. My grandfather's last words were reminded to never sell it. Oftentimes when documenting Black people's relationships to land, people situate us as helpless victims rather than experts who built intimate knowledge of what it means to be a land steward. This oral history project will be the resource I wish I had access to when writing this book. We will collect submissions digitally and in person, leveraging the people most trusted by Black elders, their children, grandchildren, and other loved ones, to create a new record for generations to come. One that tells the story of how we are environmental justice innovators who know the solutions by nature of being closest to the problems. I hope to answer the question, how do we use Black ancestral wisdom to rehabilitate this land and bridge racial wealth gaps? And more than that, I hope younger generations of Black people will be emboldened to talk to those who came before them about how we retain and sustain our relationship to this land. The big, big out is Grandpa. He's my dad. Oh yeah, he bought 78 yeah. acres, is that what it is, or 82, I forgot. I thought it was 90. You might be right. All of this out there is his, and he bought it for Zen. And then there's another 5.8 acres in another location. That's the tag and wagon. That we pay the taxes on too, so. Zen, land ownership is your future. My name is Kristen Leong. I am a writer, a multimedia producer, and a former teacher. My project for Creative Capital is called The Family Court Report. For this work, I will be drawing on a more personal part of my background, my time as a single mom, fighting for my safety and my son's safety through our family court system. This work has been simmering under the surface of every personal, creative, academic, journalistic endeavor that I have embarked on over the last 15 years. A government watchdog group claims the family court system in one metro county is corrupt. And tonight they're calling for a full-fledged investigation of Fulton County Family Court. If you have untrained judges that don't understand the dynamics of trauma, they will make assumptions and those assumptions will lead to decisions that are based upon error. America's family court system is broken. I've experienced it firsthand. The Family Court Report is a multimedia exploration of domestic violence and the failure of America's family court system to protect our most vulnerable parents and children. This project will culminate in a nonfiction book and a podcast. And beyond those artifacts, my hope is that by sharing my story and the stories of other women taking on this system, we will spark much needed dialogue about the ways that our family courts are failing families. And more importantly, what we can start doing to find solutions. I am so excited to be embarking on this journey of reflection and connection and action. To learn more and to join the fight, Subscribe to the Family Court Report newsletter at familycourtreport.org. Hello everyone, Willie Kishku. My name is Joe Whittle and I'm an enrolled tribal member of the Caddo Nation of Oklahoma and a descendant of the Delaware Nation of Oklahoma. We're also known as Lenny Lenape. I'm recording this message for you today from our tribal community in Oklahoma because this is where our people were sent so that New York City could exist. Uh, I'm hoping that those of you who are present in New York for this event today will consider this as part of your land acknowledgement for the day. 
My Creative Capital Project as a photojournalist and writer is proposing that all federal lands be returned to Native Americans as damage is due for the violation of our treaties and unjust forced removals from our homelands. Uh, I'm going to share a short slideshow of photos of Lenape matriarchs joyfully reconnecting with the homeland ecology that makes us who we are as Lenape. Um, our people are both matriarchal and matrilineal, and so it's only fitting that our matriarchs lead that reconnection journey with our homeland, as they've always been the caretakers of the land for our communities. My name is Tala Khan Malik, and I'm a writer, scholar, and educator. My name is Heidi Andrea Restrepo Rhodes, and I'm a poet, scholar, educator, and cultural worker. As chronically sick and disabled queer artists of color, we draw on legacies of crypt thought and cultural production to explore the politics and poetics of illness, disability, and collective healing. Our hybrid genre book project is titled Vital Signs, and is comprised of a hundred entries in which we reimagine the terms of our living against and outside of ableist norms. In Western medicine, vital signs refer to clinical measurements that indicate the state of a patient's essential bodily functions. We find vital signs everywhere, in our homes, in the classroom and in virtual spaces as much as in the streets or concerted public convergences for creative and political life. Vital signs reach for us in the stories our grandparents have told us, in the books we reach for throughout the day, in recipes our mothers have passed down, in the curious and eerie presence of ghosts asking for history to be reckoned with, in memories and missing of the dead, in text messages and handwritten letters from beloveds as much as emails from strangers reaching out across the void. And you... You there across vast distances, or next door without me knowing it. You climbing mountains and you confined to bed. You in pain and you in ecstasy. You breathing your breath as I breathe mine. Look how we come alive in each other's presence. Do you hear my heart's beat picking up speed? I'm Laurie Sheff, and I'm a poet and novelist. Samuel Beckett once said, to find a form to accommodate the shape of the mess, this is the task of the artist now. My work takes place in the space where poem, novel, and essay intersect. My project Cyborg Futures is an investigation into pharmaceutical and biomedical interventions into living bodies with a focus on DES, which is a synthetic estrogen given to pregnant women from the 1950s to the 1970s. It was approved by the FDA without any controlled studies. A proven carcinogen, it harmed millions of unborn children, including myself.
Hi, I'm Emily Bass. I'm a writer, an AIDS activist, an artist, and a historian, and I am thrilled to have creative capital support for my current project, The Dendron Project. The Dendron Project spans creative nonfiction, historical research, visual art, individual and collective practice, and is concerned with the immune system and with making new stories and true stories about the immune system and immunology that are alternatives to the flattened, politicized, commodified discourse of these pandemic times. The centerpiece of the Dendron Project is a biography of my favorite immune cell. Do you have a favorite immune cell? Do you want one? My favorite immune cell is the dendritic cell. This cell moves through our bodies with a nonlinear exploratory motion, picking up threats and unrecognized objects and carrying them whole into immunologic community to prompt further action. I'm borrowing from the cell's practices to create this book, moving through the lives and histories of three scientists whose work led to the discovery and understanding of what this cell did. I'm picking up pieces and putting them together to make a story that is about science and immunology, but is also about how we understand and define filth and debris, female identity, queer identity, Jewish identity, domesticity. It is about fascism and colonialism, and political systems that purport to deliver public health and instead promote death. I'm also making the history for this book in Dendron Project Labs, including my own art studio and in collective workshops that use text and gesture and visual art to render understandings of the immune system. I call these immune responses. And what I need now are co-investigators for the Dendron Project Labs. So if you'd like to make immune responses with me, please let me know. My name is Trisha Lowe and my project is called Faded, a genre bending novel about friends Anne and Diane as they attempt to thwart narrative conclusions of futurity and identity. Anne is named after the Chinese character for gratitude and Diane is anything but Princess Diana, a second generation cautionary tale. Neither of them feels these biographical features are especially relevant to their lives because Diane and Anne spend all their time in each other's bedrooms where it's dark and bereft of anticipation. They meet at a fundraiser for the Chinatown Coalition. Diane is weighed with black, Anne dowdy in a floral gown. Diane's frown makes her old. Anne's smile is gently young, but when she stretches, everything pulls and Diane sideways with her. The planes of their jaws made hard for a collision. Are you hitting on me? Un says. Have you ever even pulled one shift at the mutual aid center? Diane asks. They hack at their oddness with discourse, a social instrument that clings, misshapen, like plastic wrap. Sanrio sweatshops, the whole cultural revolution fetish and its impacts on bad leftist fashion. Jollibee taking Hollow Hollow off the menu, or at least at Great Mall in Fremont, and that's all that matters anyway. And asks, sorry, did you have any more nothing you wanted to talk about? Diane says, sorry, did you think I didn't have next week's food distro spreadsheet to finish? And laughs at her, lethal, pink plastic barrettes in her hair. Diane is starting to see how their insolence deviates from the same outline. She has the urge for her shins to hit the ground. She wants to lay her head on Un's heels. She would like to chase the feeling of being open at the soul. It's not about sex. Diane feels responsibility flee her how she imagines it must when some fool gives up and chooses to believe in the apocalypse. Hey everybody, it's Pamela Sneed. My project is called America is Ready, a book of epics based on an unpublished poem that I started years ago, having to do with the value of artists in a country that devalues them. It is predicated on Audre Lorde's 
Poetry is not a luxury and is meant to be a contemporary howl from the perspective of a black lesbian artist. It is more than 100 pages, a blend of satire, social commentary, and personal narrative. The epic began as America Ain't Ready, but my idea is to revise it based on these times and have it be the title poem of a new collection, which would include new and epic poetry based on George Floyd, the Black Panther film, and travels in West Africa and South Africa. It is focused on race, identity, gender, sexual orientation, and social justice. America is ready. Hi, I'm Corey Archangel, a 2006 Creative Capital Emerging Fields grantee. Uh, For me, there's life before creative capital and after creative capital. And I remember the most important part was somebody sat me down and was like, this is what a 401k is. You need to get one. And I have one still 20 years later. I guess you have them until you retire. Uh, But anyway, speaking of money, you have some of it and you're looking for something to do with it. Please give it to creative capital and to artists instead of uh, Tesla or uh, Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or whatever. And now here are some tech vids. For me, it's, it's really about bearing witness, right, to the, the geophysical and anthropogenic processes that are in fact the substance of climate change on a planetary level. Talking, yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a conversation, it's like, and suddenly I could hear it. Yeah, it's very moving. Sounds like a bunch of whales. Cool to sort of stand here in the middle of this and like right. look at this and try to wonder what that is. What I really like about people listening to these sounds as they're situated in the environment is that what they're hearing hasn't been extracted from somewhere else. This this is what's moving through the air where we stand, you know, even if it's coming from hundreds of miles away. Just because we can't see it or hear it doesn't mean it's not happening. Yep. Love okay. this. Who wants to go next? My name is Catherine Behar, and I'm an interdisciplinary artist and writer. My work deals with gender, race, class, and labor in digital culture. Lately, I've been focusing on automation, which is where robots and other non-human objects do work that would otherwise have to be done by humans. And I consider this in light of the history of offloading unwanted work onto those considered less than human. My creative capital project, Inside Outsourcing, started when I learned that basketry is the only mass production process that hasn't been automated. And I wanted to know why. So this project is going to look at automation, human-machine collaboration, and dexterity in the intersections between basketry and robotics. I approached Northeastern University's Helping Hands Lab, and we are going to attempt the impossible, teaching robots to make baskets. 
I plan to mend their inevitable failures with help from expert basket weavers to make sculptures. I'm working with dancers who will each embody a finger in a hand that grasps at straws. Using motion capture will translate their body skilled data to drive a digital model of a robotic hand. So this is going to be an exercise in dexterity that's also an exercise in futility. I'm looking for partners to join me in Inside Outsourcing to share introductions to curators and exhibition venues and expert basket weavers. Basketry is one of our oldest technologies and it's also an art form that disappears. Organic materials can decompose, knowledge can be lost as elders pass, and many materials and practices are indigenous to areas at direct risk from the climate crisis. So I'm urgently seeking those connections. I'm also seeking collaborative roboticists, film and mocap production support, and a sound designer. Inside Outsourcing addresses serious subject matter with a humorous touch and with the bigger aim of cultivating care through collaborative engagements with objects. Thanks for your support. I want to start with this feeling, an out of place feeling, a contradiction, a contamination. To me, this is familiar, the feeling of being contaminated, an alienation, an othering, and also when the contaminant is the self. My creative capital project is a speculative fiction told across a short film and an artist book activated by augmented reality holograms. It delves into geoengineering through the lens of queer metabolisms of contamination and invites being with the inhuman through the material metaphor of the xenolith, a geological term for alien stone. It centers around a geothermal power plant in Iceland, where excess carbon dioxide is capped, liquefied, and injected into subterranean bedrock. Here it mineralizes as calcite within the porous cavities of fresh basalt stone, forming a synthetic xenolith, a transformed body whose holes are filled with foreign matter. The fossil fuel industry first developed the technique to maximize fuel extraction from emptied reservoirs. Although geoengineering is proposed to combat global warming, it nonetheless leaves extractive infrastructures intact. Synthetic xenoliths thus present as troubled metaphors for adapting to life in a contaminated world. My name is Caitlin Berrigan, and I work as a visual artist and writer across films, texts, and new media technologies. My recent works explore the poetics of queer science fiction as world-making practices. EO Studio, founded by Eto Otetekbe, is made up of three core members. Eto, a Nigerian-American polymedia artist based in Brooklyn, New York. Michael DiCarlo, a computational designer based in Barcelona, Spain. And Amanda Kardahi, an Egyptian-American multidisciplinary artist based in Houston, Texas. We've collaborated with an expanding network of artists, designers, researchers, and cultural workers to develop polymedia installations and public projects since 2014. Some of our current projects include A Peaceful Journey in Mount Vernon, New York, Eminative in Harlem, New York, Invasive Species, and Casco, both in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Tenkukbe Incubation Lab uses research and technology to question normative building materials and fabrication methods. We seek to develop alternative ways to create an imagined and collectively owned present. Tenkukbe means to join together in Yorubo, a Nigerian dialect that is threatened with extinction. 
So we think of Tenkuk Bay as a form of authorship, structures, and social building blocks that construct objects, installations, and architecture that prefigure a livable future in the present. In a broader sense, as various forms of technology are used to classify, innovate, and act on our lives, we wonder how to develop alternative ways to create our own imagined present. How do the things we construct hold a shared identity? Can processes that involve co-authorship be liberating? Do they provoke visibility? The Kugbe's purpose is not to build something new, but instead to evaluate and replace outdated solutions. The process can activate aesthetic and structural opportunities to achieve environmental sustainability and well-being. Hi, my name is Pangil Han. My art practice often weaves together code, performance, and video, and in more recent works, weaving itself. I'm interested in the use of online spaces and archives as sites of disclosure and declaration that blur and complicate the distinction between public and private. In 2019, Project Amplify an advocacy group for child migrants, published several hundred declarations given by children talking about their journey from home, why they left, and their hopes and dreams for life in America. From these stories, I created Alma, a half-human and half cinderblock house character who's also a trained large language conversational AI. Her memories, origins, and personalities are as multifaceted and fragmented as you might imagine. My creative capital project, Data Tundra, places Alma inside a virtual land loosely based on Carta Tundra, an imaginary map created by a group of women in 17th century France that charts the path to true love as well as the emotional pitfalls to avoid. Tarta Tundra is a world exploration video game where the player accompanies Alma in this imagined borderland where they have to navigate the precarity of empathy and memory together. I'm using the interactive gameplay as a way of approaching the complex theme of the ongoing migrant crisis and how our embodied and imagined realities and futures are engendered by the coded legal and political frameworks inscribed in the historical and emotional landscape. Hello, I'm Cezanne Charles. And I'm John Marshall. Root of Two is a research and practice-driven art design and technology studio we founded in 1998. We live and work in Detroit. Ours is a collaboration that subverts and reimagines systems, infrastructures and networks. Our projects explore the consequences of underimagined futures and facilitate people to imagine and shape collective actions for more just, resilient, inclusive and adaptive ones. We prototype and test ideas in real-world contexts, refining and evolving our approach with each project. Our creative capital project, Any Space Whatever, is a pavilion designed to provoke thought, serve as an emblem, and host community technology workshops, people's assemblies, and research exchanges. Our project explores innovative materials and strategies to create structures and objects that resist and evade machine vision. The structure is designed to function as an air-gapped multimedia production booth and flexible presentation, workshop and discussion space. Drawing inspiration from science fiction, Afro-modernist and futurist aesthetics, as well as traditional Scottish communal gathering spaces, Any Space Whatever fosters a rich and diverse environment for hosting critical discussions and creative actions. Any Space Whatever envisions a future where urban technology is equitable and consentful. Through workshops and people's assemblies, we'll collaborate to address privacy, open data, and access and inclusion in civic tech. 
Until funding and a site have been acquired, we will develop a mobile intervention capable of hosting a variety of programming and appropriate to a number of different contexts. Join us in shaping the future of technology in urban places. Become a part of the movement for more equitable, consentful, and connected cities. Hi, this is Texeri.space, transforming human loss into digital tapestry. So this is the homepage, which you can view from your cell phone, tablet, or computer. And you'll notice there's two options to start, one to view all tapestries and the other to create a tapestry. We'll start here. And the first thing is to select what kind of loss I want to honor. So you'll see there's a list of different losses that one might want to think about. I'm going to pick a loss of a loved one to a virus and click next. And then I have the option to honor this grief with either words, image, or sound. So in the case of image, I'd be able to drag and drop or upload a picture here. Or sound, I can upload or drag and drop pre-recorded um, audio files, which are listed below. In this case, though, I'm just going to make an entry with words and say, I miss the sound of your voice. So to review, I'm honoring a loss of a loved one to a virus with words and click begin weaving. And after a moment, what you see are my words interwoven with many other entries that people have made honoring their loss of a loved one to a virus. And you can see all the different photographs here, different text, um, which has been woven in. I can do a screen grab of this and choose to go back and create another tapestry or make a, another entry into the same category. I can also view all tapestries. And this is a way of getting a sense of how different losses, how different loss tapestries look. Hi, I'm Sam Levine. And I'm Tiga Brain. Our work frequently intervenes in systems to reveal their political and cultural implications. Computational systems, bureaucratic systems, romantic systems, and data systems. We're interested in questions of quantification, control, and how technologies reconfigure agency. In our new work, Offset, we're attempting to build a carbon registry and a marketplace that allows you to offset your emissions in unconventional ways. A carbon offset is an action that reduces or prevents or otherwise compensates for carbon emissions. By purchasing offsets, you can, mathematically speaking, negate some or all of your emissions. Carbon offsets apply the logic of capitalism to the atmosphere. This logic assumes that all activities on Earth can be quantified, abstracted, and therefore exchanged. Offsets let us outsource the effects of consumption, at the scale of the individual, the corporation, or even the nation state, to someone else, to somewhere else, even to generations of the future. And in this sense, existing offset markets are set up to maintain the status quo, rather than address the root causes of the climate catastrophe. In contrast, we're developing a novel methodology for converting industrial sabotage and direct action into high quality premium carbon credits. For example, we can calculate the carbon savings from an action that sabotages a pipeline and shuts it down for a week, or from blockading a port that exports coal. Our goal is to convert direct actions like these into carbon credits, sell the credits to large corporations, and then transfer the money back to the original activists. How does the quantification and management of the carbon cycle change our relationships to one another? And how might this shift what's deemed appropriate and inappropriate, legal and illegal?
My name is Paula Gaetano Adi. I am an interdisciplinary artist and I make work that calls for a new technical imagination. I was born and grew up here in San Juan, Argentina, a province by the Andes, and I have returned here to conduct and work on my next robotic art project. Wanakerex is a collective technological enterprise that will deploy the first robot to cross the Andes Mountains through peaks of 4,000 meters from Argentina to Chile, following the paths used by the Andes Revolutionary Liberation Army in 1817. The project consists, first, in the design of the Wanakerex robot, an all-terrain exploration robot which had been developing in partnership with Hyundai's New Horizon studio in the Silicon Valley and also in collaboration with a team of local school teenagers, activists, engineers, and artisans. The robot design has been inspired by the local invention of the Wanakeras, DIY all-terrain vehicles developed locally in the 70s after the Wanako, an expert climate camelid native of this region. The second phase of the project is a multi-day horse track expedition and performance that will reenact José de San Martín epic crossing of the Andes that brought the emancipation of Argentina, Chile and Peru from a Spanish colony. Certainly, the most dramatic chapter in the 19th century struggle for Latin America independence. That is why I like to say that Wanakerax is above all a project about freedom. Wanakerex is the ultimate robot seeking liberation, an autonomous machine developed and programmed to reimagine a technological emancipatory practice that proposes to repair modern narratives of technological development, attending a different cosmotechnic based on Andean ancestral knowledges, biocultural diversity and life. Greetings 2023 Creative Capital Awardees. My name is Etienne Charles and I am a 2022 Creative Capital Awardee and I'm so excited for all of you and to see all of your projects. Fasten your seatbelts. You're in for a wonderful ride. Creative Capital, through their support, has been instrumental in making my project, Earth Tones, a possibility. It would not be possible without your support and I encourage you and thank you for continuing to support this great organization. You can do so by clicking on the QR code, which is right here, so that more projects can come to fruition, more support for artists. I can't wait to see what Jacques Schwartzbart does and Teresita Fernandez and my friend Nguyen Smith. So many of the great artists have come through this program and I look forward to seeing the class of 2023's work, 2024 and beyond so thank you very much i'm really excited to see more of your projects so stay tuned for more videos hey 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 What's up, Creative Capital family? My name is Casa Overall. I'm a drummer, producer, rapper, songwriter, and generally an open-minded creative that likes to find new paths of expression. I attempt to stay free of the boundaries of genre classification, but I also believe in studying musical traditions in order to maximize the medium. Two of the biggest building blocks for me come from the jazz world and the hip-hop world. For almost two decades, I've made my living as a jazz drummer while developing a unique songwriting and production style. My practice centers around a collage style editing process and various modes of improvisation and composition. With this opportunity from Creative Capital, I'm going to explore a place that has influenced me and my practice in multiple ways. My father was from Detroit. My biggest influence on the drum set, Elvin Jones, came out of Detroit. And the first person to take me on the road, Jerry Allen, also came up in Detroit. Some of my biggest inspirations in hip hop also came out of Detroit. Jay Dillon. Kareem Riggins. Though my pops is from Detroit, I didn't grow up with a connection to the city or my relatives on that side. I plan to reinstall that connection for myself, as well as connect the dots between the creative minds that have influenced me. My project has a few important elements. To examine the family history through interviews and visits. 
to also look into the lives of my musical heroes. And lastly, to create an audio-visual EP that represents all of this energy. And this energy. I also plan to further my creative practice by taking the collage art approach I use for audio art, applying it to the visual space. To the visual space. To the visual space. To the visual space. 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 Act. Hi, I'm Terry Lynn Carrington. I'm a drummer and composer and have been recently working on multidisciplinary collaborations for what I'm calling the Jazz Without Patriarchy Project. Through my work as founding artistic director for the Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice, I'm exploring ways to bring as much attention as possible to the gender problem in jazz culture, believing that the music itself won't reach its full potential until gender balance is attained with its creative contributors. We are pursuing a more inclusive sound in jazz and helping to provide space and opportunities for women and non-binary artists to present their authentic selves without the extra burdens and barriers common to non-male jazz performers. I have curated a series of installations called Shifting the Narrative, New Standards, which is focused on women composers, Seen Unseen, about the journey of Black women artists, Jerry Allen and Mary Lou Williams in Conversation, which is a script I wrote of an imagined meeting between these two iconic pianists, and The Female and Non-Binary Gaze, which illuminates a woman's point of view in jazz, both musically and visually. We completed new standards this fall and are currently working on bringing it to Boston and DC this summer. The other three are in progress and include short films involving collaborations with Carrie Mae Weems, Micheline Thomas, and Anna DeVere Smith. My goal is to have all four sections eventually as one big installation where you can see all the films and in collaboration with visual artwork and live music integrated for one big transformative experience. Looking for presenters that might be interested in this work. Have you ever wondered about the founding of America? How America became so wealthy, so powerful, so rich? It was actually on the backs of the indigenous people, and they were in turn rendered invisible in the process. Um, I'm composer Brent Michael Davids, and I'm working on Requiem for America, which sings about the invisibility of the native people from the original voices heard in the time period when these genocides occurred in both the indigenous voices from the past and also from the perpetrators. Wherever this piece is performed in the country, wherever Requiem for America is performed, hopefully in every state of the country, the local indigenous people will be included in the works, singing alongside the Western singers and orchestra. In this way, I was bringing the genocidal awareness of the founding of this country to the forefront, to a piece of music that uh, audiences can come and uh, experience, but also including Indigenous people in the collaborative process so that each orchestra and chorus is required to break down some barriers and meet their local Indigenous people that live on whose land they live and work. So that instead of rendering us invisible, Native people have a voice and our voices can be heard again. I'm Terry Janor, and I'm a musician, visual artist, writer, and researcher. My project, which is called Secret to Life, 
releases stories told to me by women of color. I conduct interviews and guided writing, and then I let these stories inspire new compositions. These works are performed by women of color musicians, skilled creative improvisers. The resulting performances also include my visual art, watercolor illustrations, fiber sculptures, and dolls. I want to create a rich, ritual-like environment where these secrets are offered and received with deep trust so that we can begin to change how we see each other in order to make some shifts in our world. Most of us have a secret or two. Why do we hold them? Who benefits? Who loses? It's my hope that through these stories told to me by these women, that we might see each other in them and that we might begin to lay down some heavy burdens and gather up the power that comes when we share what's been kept secret far too long. My name is Jamel Brown, and I am a composer, drummer, and conceptualist. Our group, Transcendence, consists of co-producer and sound designer Chris Scholar, saxophonist Jalil Shaw, and cultural designer Fermisha Brown. Our group, Transcendence, shines light on the overlooked voices of our early African-American ancestors and reimagines these stories into new music and design. On our first two albums, our goal was to show the power and beauty of spirituals and work songs. Our newest focus, Street Cries, explores the songs of African Americans who migrated north to urban areas after the end of slavery. Found within the Street Cries are links that connect early Southern spirituals and work songs to the urban music of the future, such as jazz, rock, blues, and hip hop. On every street around the world, you can hear the voices of individuals using music to express their heartfelt stories. Through our work, we want people to feel some of these overlooked stories. We are truly honored to be recipients of the Creative Capital Wilds Futures Art, Culture, and Impact Award. We will be using this opportunity to create multimedia presentations around our work. Transcendence is a breathing art form. It looks both forwards and backwards simultaneously. It weaves the present through the past into the future. I'm Ayn Gordon, introducing Condolence, working title. Three years ago, this funeral director told me his job was to ease mourning for the still living more than care for the dead. 
Fifteen months ago, my father died during a snowstorm, forcing me to call 911, sending his body through morgue drawers in Queens and a New Jersey crematorium. This non-recyclable box held his ashes. This is the recyclable cardboard box that plastic box came in. This is the pouch that held those boxes, all synthetic, so it will be here long after I'm gone. This is the bag the funeral home provides to carry both boxes and the velvet pouch. See the eternal flame? Eternal like perhaps the plastic box and synthetic pouch, but not like the body cremated. Eternal like maybe grief. Victorians propped up dressed corpses for one last portrait and made jewelry like this from their hair. My ancestral Ashkenazis used to rip their garments when someone died. Now you pin on some black ribbon already cut. I took my father's ashes to the ocean. I've learned crematoriums are bad for the carbon footprint, but there's a water-based process. But so many gallons amid escalating droughts, but six states legalize body composting, but that's three times the cost of cremation, so it's not my first time with ashes. I know they don't scatter. They're heavy and clump and stick. Why use language to portray death as an act of passing away or scattering as opposed to grief calcifying into maybe unwanted thing that you do carry? But also why pretend we don't want to carry something, even if it's only memory or DNA or a photographed corpse or an eternal flame printed on a non-compostable bag? How long are remains still who you loved? Who is mourning for? Who heals? Do you want to heal? Condolence asks who contemporary death and dying practices actually comfort and how we can lovingly, responsibly release a body into the ecosystem. It will be theater. I'm, I'm, I'm super interested in working in, in the kind of format of the Asclepion, the uh, installation, performance with video. This sort of archetype work that I do has, has been um, largely hinged on um, Christian images, um, esoteric Christianity, the lives of the saints. Um, and in recent years, going into the myths, it's these um, videos that we've already been working on. They sort of started to work on the Asclepion, um, Pasiphae, Witch Queen of Crete, a glory hole origin story. It's part of this dream orgone chamber, so using the chamber as a, a screening room. So that this will be how the video is installed within the Asclepion. Looking at um, old plans of the Asclepion, um, there's often a, a depiction of a statue of, a, of, the, of Asclepius on his throne with the staff with the one snake crawling up it. And um, I think rather than treat him like a god or a demigod, I, I wanted to um, go back to a cephalous monster. I like to carry an element forward from the previous piece. And so the Asiphal still fascinates me, this substitute for God. I've been long interested in, in these notions of healing. And I could already understand that most people understand a healing, like a miraculous healing, as a restoration um, ra rather than ending up somewhere else. I think that just part of life, as a lot of us have come to know, is, is about physical therapy, some mental health therapy. So um, yeah, I have a broad notion of what, what's in the spectrum of healing. It's really weird. Sometimes these babies end up showing up to our shows. See, and they're like constantly asking for leche. They're like, leche, leche, leche. Oh my God, it's so annoying. Yeah, we can all relate to that. Yes, of course. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like how do these people even get into our venue? <laughs> they're hungry as hell. <laughs> Liz and Bo, also known for their femme reggaeton band Niña, are rumored to start working on a new world tour called Novelas de Niñas. 
they have kept pretty quiet about the tour. All we have heard is that they are thinking about having a lavish, futuristic quinceanera theme with new videos, live camera work, a full cast, and will be premiering at a banquet hall in Hialeah, Florida. Bueno, see, and we're gonna have like a dance team that's all drones. Yeah, I mean, come on! We're so excited about that. I love that! Yeah, look, we can't give away too much, but the twins and the twerkers have been confirmed. We're so oh! excited! Nina started out to bring diverse voices to the male-dominated genre of reggaeton. Sometimes their shows have been described as musical, chaotic soap operas. With their witty lyrics, cameos, and unconventional visuals, you just don't know what they will bring next. Oh my god, the last show we did was so funny. We had to sí. use chairs as a stage. Sí. <laughs> yeah, it was like shaking my butt so much that I almost fell off. <laughs> oh my god. Another really memorable show was in New York City. I, I have a video of this because I wanted to show this. This is a video of one of the events that you guys showed out. Look at the reaction on this. <laughs> else will Liz and Bo have for us? You will just have to wait and see. My name is Aaron Landsman and uh, I'm a multidisciplinary performance maker. And my piece is called Nightkeeper. I am a nightkeeper. Guardian of sleeplessness and fear. Designate of the restless in all the landscapes where I am. So Nightkeeper started because I was going through some insomnia during a moment of kind of spiritual crisis about five years ago. And so when this happened, I just started writing from the voice that was coming up as I couldn't sleep, rather than doing the thing that most of us do, which is like, try to calm yourself down, read something boring, um, listen to music, or get up and walk around. I just got up, took out my notebook, and just started writing what was coming to me. And it turned out to be this really loopy, circuitous text that included memories and dreams, um, fears and worries, as well as a kind of ecstatic sense of being part of the city at night in a way that I hadn't appreciated before. Insomnia is something we tend to go through alone, and it, I found it helpful at times to think about like all the other people in the city who are not sleeping while I was not sleeping. Whether they worked a night shift or they had a hard time sleeping, that was just super interesting to me, and I wanted that to be part of the piece. And I especially was drawn to the idea of making a whole performance in low light. And so I really like the idea of like, what's a challenge you can give yourself as a maker that will keep you honest and keep you kind of trying to problem solve in ways that are interesting. So I thought, oh, it's at night, it's about insomnia, it should be low light. I would like the audience to take away the sense that they're not alone when they feel alone. That's the big grand, you know, at least for a moment. I'd love them to leave in the kind of dream state or fugue state of being awake late at night, whether it's by choice or not. Hi, I'm Heather Raffo, and I'm working on a new theater platform on the subject of migration in the global economy. And what I mean by a theater platform is I'm creating an epic map of a play that I hope to be the first ever expansive, ever evolving, cyclically structured play. It involves a play cycle where I write on the theme of migration in scenes that take place across the world. And all these scenes get put into 
a giant map of a play that I'm calling a theater platform. So if we were to do a live production, let's say that would end up being about 15 of these scenes, but ultimately the goal is to have 365 scenes that take place across the world. For my Creative Capital Grant, I'm really working on an immersive web platform that allows me to build an algorithm around currency and location so that any reader or any user that wants to, they've experienced this play live, but they want to do a deep dive into what more this play can be, would go to a website and type in the currency, type in location, and the algorithm would spit them out a purpose-built play just for them centering their location in the world. The other hope is that participating theaters would each get a bespoke scene written for them. And so this could be a kind of rolling co-production where everybody has their own world premiere with their own scene centered and audiences could follow this story of migration for years to come. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Samar Haddad King, and I'm the writer and composer of Radio Act, a new musical inspired by the role of independent radio in wartime. I'm also the founding artistic director of Ya Samar Dance Theater, a dance theater company based between New York and Palestine, where I choreograph, compose, direct, and devise multimedia performances. Radio Act is inspired by an actual independent radio station in Syria during the revolution that began in 2011 and tells the fictional story of May and Omar, a husband and wife team and their crew of colleagues forced to make impossible decisions in an effort to keep the station afloat and inspire their communities despite every effort to silence them. As the revolution turns deadly, the station is under constant threat and becomes their lifeline and vehicle through which they dream of a better future. With content that is entertaining, tactical, and informative, the station becomes a beacon of hope, empowerment, and release. Using a mix of genres, including hip hop, maqam, traditional Arab music, rock, and Broadway, the music is often the medium through which the radio hosts speak to their listeners, conveying vital messages of resistance. They use humor to lessen the weight of the mounting threats and horrors around them. Radio Act, while set in a volatile landscape, centers around these individuals and their choices, and explores what happens when these solutions come into conflict, not only with the world around them, but with one another. Radio Act is in the early stages of development. I am working on a second draft of the script alongside the show's director, Amir Nizar Zabi, award-winning writer, director, and current artistic director of The Walk with Little Amal, and have 15 songs in progress. I am currently seeking producing partners for this project and residency and workshop opportunities for staged and industry readings and financing to eventually take this production to the stage. My name is Kimi. I'm an American theater artist currently living in Shimane, Japan. Five years ago, I moved to this small town in the western part of the country where my mother was born. Like countless rural communities across Japan and around the world, its population has been shrinking and aging. The resulting number of abandoned houses has grown exponentially. For my project, Ichioku House, I'm transforming one of these houses into both the main character and setting of a new immersive performance piece. Playing with the discourse of historic house tours, the audience will be led from room to room, experiencing a story that interweaves magical realism with oral histories from this area and memories from my family in both Japan and America. Like a giant living organism made up of many chambers, each room will house different installations and performances using natural materials, found objects, light, video, sound, and movement. As with some of my previous work, this project will focus on the importance of preserving the memories and objects that belong to past generations. But rather than trying to rebuild an idealized image of the past, 
I'm curious how communities might function like any living organism, adapting to change. Ichioku House will explore how all of us living in the space between cultures create home and identity in the tension between what we let go of and what we hold on to. Right now, I'm in the process of identifying and acquiring a house. Once the installation is complete, I'll be hosting regular performances throughout the year, letting the piece shift and change with the seasons. I hope you'll consider visiting me here in Japan and experiencing it for yourself. It's been my life's passion to create original content with deaf actors. I've directed a feature documentary about deaf entertainers, produced 30 episodes of a sign language series, and even directed a music video. My journey started as a voicing actor touring with the National Theater of the Deaf. After years of working in the deaf community, I see thousands of untold stories with unique perspectives. for films, TV shows, and theater are written in English and then translated into ASL. Not Another Deaf Story is a full-length multimedia live theater production being devised in ASL with an ensemble of deaf actors. Once the play is developed, it will then be translated into English. Voicing actors will make the ASL accessible for hearing audiences. Stories are how we make ourselves known to ourselves and others. We're utilizing personalized stories, like how a chorus line was developed, to create a theatrical experience. We're bringing you some pretty unique perspectives. We're having our first work in progress performances here in Los Angeles with the hopes of having our world premiere at a regional theater in 2024 or 2025. Thank you, Creative Capital, for supporting Not Another Deaf Story. Hi everyone, this is the one and only Julie Atlas Muse. And here I present to you Matt Fraser, and together we are One, one of us. us. We met on May the 5th, 2006, on the stage of Coney Island, Sanctuary by the Seashore, and we've not looked back since. Sleeping Beauty is the third original production of The Panto Project, a five-year community commitment to festive family fun in collaboration with Abrams Arts Centre and the Henry Street Settlement in New York's Lower East Side. The Panto Project heralds a new redefining approach to American theatre for the holiday season, an inclusive, progressive, super fun and fast-paced holiday family show celebration with a story of good triumphing over evil that promotes community values. With Sleeping Beauty, we're overhauling the traditional form of the British panto. Don't worry, we're keeping the good bits, high production values, call and response, the anarchy, cross-dressing, songs and jokes, but we're also making the content less intrusive and more contemporary and inclusive, with a diverse cast that embeds a love of local live entertainment in our younger audiences and local communities. We remove economic barriers for our audience by providing subsidised tickets to local New York City Housing Authority residents, while also employing over 30 artists. With the Henry Street Settlement's great support in 2022, we gave over 1,600 free tickets, busing in local families, schools and shelters from the Lower East Side, where income disparity ranks highest in all the districts of New York City. Change starts in small spaces and grows outwards. Ideas that inspire in a theatre, showing our ideals for living, can be taken outside the four walls and grow into actions that can change the world, literally. 
coming together through the power of art to vanquish the isolation and desperation that so many feel by laughing, singing and dancing, at least for the two hours of the show, leaves a better place for our artists and audiences and all of our future. Bonjour, my name is Ethan Lipton, and I'm a writer working in theater and music. And my creative capital project is called We Are Your Robots. It's a show that I'm developing with the director Lee Silverman and my bandmates of almost two decades, Eben Levy, Ian Riggs, and Vito Dieterle. In We Are Your Robots, we play a band of robots who look just like us. And uh, we have come to the theater for a demonstration to try to answer the question, what do human beings want from their machines? As the narrator, I will first need to gain the audience's trust. That's something all machines must do. And then I will try to prove to the audience that I possess some kind of intelligence, perhaps even consciousness, that I am reliable, and that I'm not going to hurt them or steal their jobs. Although, you know, always possible. This show uh, explores big issues like brain mapping, happiness, caretaking, violence, sex, all the exciting stuff. We're trying to get people to interrogate their own ideas of what it means to be a person in a world with artificial intelligence and robotics and a lot of machines. This show has already had a workshop. It was commissioned by Media Arts Exploration and now I'm working on the text and writing some new songs. The band is doing some new arrangements for underscoring for the show, and we are preparing a chunky and delicious projection element, which is something we've never worked with before. You know, artificial intelligence is such a complicated part of our lives now, and I just wanna say how grateful I am to get to explore some of these ideas in theatrical form, hopefully to get them in front of an audience so that they can explore some of these ideas while we are also um, gaining access to their data. So thanks, Creative Capital. Love ya. Call now. The phones are ringing, operators are standing by, and they're ready to take your pledge for Creative Capital. That's right. The phones cannot stop ringing off the hook. Don't just look at my face and my pores, which thankfully are somewhat forgiven by the Zoom recording because while we gave tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars out this year, we're still using Zoom to record the introduction to today's little movie situation. Call now. Pledge pledge your entire grant back to Creative Capital. Um, if you don't want to do that because you actually need to use it to pay for the project that you propose, turn to the person next to you who may not be a grantee and say, hey, do you have extra money lying around? Why don't you pledge it to Creative Capital so I can do my work even better than before? It pays for things like mentoring, for uh, this event today, for gatherings of artists. It really just builds this whole community of artists. And so we need you to pick up your phone and like shoot it at the QR code, which I'm going to say will be here or here. And, and just, 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 just to have more of that free drinks that you've been having in the lobby and just hit zero. First hit a number that's greater than zero, then hit zero a bunch of times after it and then hit submit. All right. Are we ready for more videos? This is super exciting. Are you eating your free popcorn? Are you drinking your free drinks? Stay tuned and watch these videos. Woo! Hi, my name is Sidra Bell and I am a choreographer and educator. I am working on a new project with composer Emmanuel Wilkins that will premiere in May 2024 at the Gibney Dance Center. The project really is a devised piece for music and dance and theater, and one of our hopes is that we can spend as much residency time together as possible so that we can create a work that's truly unique to itself in the development of multiple languages and approaches to new theater. The seed for this particular project started at the 92nd Y, and we did spend 
uh, about a week together uh, in person and also a week on Zoom creating movement modalities. And what I love about Emmanuel's work is that it has a lot of joy and spirituality to it. And in this new work, I really want to reflect that sense of life force that his work really conjures with lots of beautiful color and richness and dynamic movement. The dancers in the company are really beautiful technicians, artists that have beautiful expressivity, and they add a lot to the movement design in their improvisational work and bring a lot of what's happening now in contemporary culture to the work. So the movement ideas and the musical ideas are really generated from the ensemble effort. It's uh, thrilling to be working with Creative Capital to bring something this expansive to fruition. Extinction Rituals is a multi-year, multi-dimensional project that will result in a series of performance and visual artworks. We take on a journey of introspection and action as we confront the possibility of ecosystems collapse and the fragility of life on Earth. Remembrance, collecting mourning, and contemplation powers our imagination to create nutrient environments where transformation is possible. We are creating multiple kinds of encounters with artists, scientists, community members, sabedores and knowledge keepers in our places of origin, Japan and Colombia, and in our current home, New York. Through these gatherings, we open opportunities to embody and sense different ways of knowing and feeling, to empower each other through collective imagining and to cultivate spaces for social actions related to place-specific environmental and extinction issues. Our artistic creations for this project encompass a range of mediums and creative processes. The journey itself is a social sculpture. Currently, we are in the first phase of the project during which we are collaborating with our company, the LeMay Ensemble in Colombia, New York, and guest composers to create a movement-based stage performance that will premiere in 2024-2025. As we continue on this journey, future works in other mediums will emerge and evolve. We will be creating a multi-channel video art installation in a series of sculptural artifacts, photographs, in a book tracing the experiences. We believe that creation is an act of remembering while simultaneously becoming, a serpentine act of many temporalities, resonance and echoes. Our projects have multi-year processes that exist in the exchange, the in-between, the journey, and the multidimensional interactions. Through extinction rituals, we intend to integrate all of these resonance. Concerts, comedy clubs, cold press, papers. You know, crying in public is one of my favorite things to do. It's, it's raw, it's real, it's random, you know, crying. Crying on the subway makes the movie about you. And <laughs> you know, someone told me that once, and it's so true that, that when you're crying on the subway, the movie is definitely about you. Growing Pains, Full House, Small Wonder, Mr. Belvedere, Hold Me Closer, Tiny Danza. <laughs> Hold Me Closer, Tony Danza. Plenty, Pleasure, Jazzy, Jam.
Kumusta kadake yo amin? I'm Jasmine Orpilia. I'm an Ilocana American voice centered composer of operatic sound installations that dance. My work comes from my lifelong studied practices of Filipino folk dance, Filipino combat systems, ancestral epic chants, and indigenous music of the Philippines. In my solo productions, I consciously wield every role from composer, multi-instrumental musician, singer, dancer, writer, researcher, sound designer, etc. in order to exemplify a hands-on understanding of an economy of care that prioritizes sourcing from and for indigenous Filipino artisans, Philams, Filipinos throughout the diaspora. My solo project, Oracion, consists of larger-than-life sound-activated Filipino bulletproof vests, anting anting, which are encrypted with Oracion spells. Traditionally worn as a secret layer of second skin in order to protect from gunfire or harm during critical times of revolution, these anting anting garments also open sacred gateways in over eight languages, which I will sing and simultaneously dance in a close quarter combat meets courtship choreography inspired by my own family's history. More. On the development of Oracion and my body of work at jasmineopilia.com. Thank you. Agyam nakreunay.
Two figures on screen, side by side, in boxes, Kick-ass. different environments. Text, I'm Laura Lawson, Lawson, Sydney Skybetter. I am a white genderqueer person with crop teal hair and a teal shirt. I'm Sydney Skybetter. I'm a white man with Sydney asymmetrical facial hair, shark 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 slavic eye circles, and, and a light blue collared shirt. Sydney and I are working on a... Text, the choreo daemonic platform. Choreo, Endeavor dance, embodied knowledge, daemon, intelligence, algorithm. Platform. Humans change the world just by existing. This is a work about interdependence, using dance and technology to show how we are relationally interconnected with each other and our world. And how we shape and are shaped by technology. This work will be multiply manifesting and choreo-computational. Artists, audiences, and AI will contend with symbiotic and adversarial relationships between nature, art, and emerging technology. We're choreographers. Community organizers, Ethical design, engineers, knowledge, designers, equitable access. We make technologies. Of the body, human, robot, and algorithmic intelligences. Sensors, software, subsonics, user interfaces to the environment. We've been thinking about what happens when computational systems are embodied and configured choreographically in performance. We'll be working with tech that folks have never experienced in a show before. But more importantly, we're thinking about who owns movement a white and who board owns covered innovation. In sticky notes Equity, and scribbles. justice, and accessibility are fundamental. To building out a coalition that insists on artists' rights to their own tools of the practice and the content they create. We're looking for allies. Funding. Access. Questioning. And you can find more information about us at... Choreodaemonics.org. The Choreodaemonic platform. Lead artist Laurel Lawson and Sydney Skybetter. Video editing and audio description Laurel Lawson. Additional videography by Paul Rochford Jr. Studio. With thanks to CRCI and Brown, Brown University. With support from Creative Capital and the Doris Duke Foundation. Ball onto the table. Laurel rolls up and lifts it inquisitively. Solo Badolo from Burkina Faso. The work I'm making, I'm making work about the divination. Divination is a, a ancient technique from all over the place, but specifically Burkina Faso, we have the different type and so many type of divination. How to use the sign to tell story, how to make, how to use a sign, to use the courage shells, how to use drawing, how to use like a step of the, the rat on the, on the ash to heal. And then um, I'm investigating about this word and about this type of work. And I'm researching mostly about Burkina Faso, the ethnic groups in Burkina Faso, the north, the central north, the west, the southwest, all the, all these sides of Burkina Faso. When you go, to, you have a different way how they make their work, how they make their work on this divination sign. They use rocks, they use uh, so many things, they use uh, sticks and to divine. And then so on, um, I use all these tools to make my work. And then my work is focused on that. make with the public. I make with the public. I have complex feelings about gathering with an American public. I attempt to be transparent and generous about that. The civics of a Boricua citizen, a citizenship circumscribed by U.S. possession. I attempt to be transparent and generous about that. 
Difficult conversations are the stuff of radical democracy, necessary and requiring collective construction. Performance is the commons, a public engaged in negotiation of material, history, rules, and governance with one another. The public already participates inside systems of coercive power. The practice of that is generations deep media, image, and propaganda deep. I offer an alternative practice. My work creates space for communal gathering, considering the ancient history of performance as a civic and social space. Around an emergent dance, we feel pulse become one body. Around the making of an image, we become uneasy. Around food, we ingest ingredients that have come together through harmony and conflict, enacting our own words, gestures, memories, responding to our own activating presence in the public is how we confront our place in the world. I think discomfort is useful. I think discomfort is useful. Transformation requires you to become something you have never been. Esta es la bendición que exijo. Hi, I'm Rashawn. I'm Silas. And we're at the beginning stages of a new collaborative dance project we're calling Open Machine. In Open Machine, we're working with social dynamics and technological systems as a way to reveal the human, vulnerable, and interior mechanics of creation. Open Machine is an interactive performance which evokes systems of surveillance, games of social hierarchy, personality tests, and our ongoing cultural obsession with identifying and categorizing humans. Like links in a chain or the advancing levels in a video game, the performance builds upon itself as the audience moves through the spaces of the theater, on stage, off stage, backstage, and finally outdoors. Open Machine is a modular, multifaceted work that can be taken apart and rearranged in different ways. Its analog and digital components can be focused for indoor stationary settings. Its roving and participatory elements can be activated in hybrid spaces. The outdoor component, where audio scores enable community participation, can also be staged by itself. Through a multi-sensory processing of gathered and sorted information, the dancing, the sound, and the visual design generate a unique aesthetic and energetic frequency that both questions and revels in the ways our human experiences are shaped by and through technology. Hi, I'm Reggie Brown. Now, I believe it's time for cocktails, so get ready for your party shoes and also to meet one another. And I'd like to thank you, along with my fellow board members, for all that you do to support Creative Capital. Thank you very much, and I'll see you soon.